Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the exploration and cultivation of the outside genius found in neurodivergence. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. My name is Lillian Skinner. Today, I want to talk about communication and how higher intelligence, gifted intelligence, particularly neurodivergent gifted intelligence, makes communication difficult. I don't mean that it's communication difficult that you are struggling to understand others as much as I mean others are are struggling to understand you, because that has been my experience completely. I was reading that 30-point gap in our IQ was enough to actually hinder it. It meant you couldn't communicate. And I spoke prior about my one friend, her manager said she was over-communicating. I've met other people who said that they were under-communicated because they weren't talking enough because they were too quiet. And I just want to push back on those because literally we are forced to, as outliers, to constantly come in at average. And the further you are from average, the harder that is not so much that you don't understand others, but that they can't understand you. And this is something I've experienced to an extreme degree my whole life. I have parents, particularly my mother and my younger siblings, who do not understand what I'm talking about half the time. And they will assume I mean it in a way that I didn't mean it. I am very factual. My sister told me that when she was 12, I really, really hurt her feelings because I said that she had become funny. I had just come home. I was 18 at the time. And I came back and I hadn't seen her in a year. And she said something very witty and funny at the table. And I was like, wow, you've become funny since I left. And she said, that really hurt me. You were trying to say that I wasn't funny or something. And I was like, no, I meant it quite literally that your brain had grown. And from the time I had last seen you, you had grown wit. Now we're in our thirties and she's telling me this story. And I'm like, well, I didn't mean it any other way than the way I said it. I meant simply you'd grown up, you'd become witty, your brain had changed, and it was no longer you were doing silly, goofy antics to get her laughs, but you were actually saying things that were quite witty. But I didn't go into detail because she didn't say anything at that moment. She just said, oh, I hadn't really thought about it because for me, that was like a simple, just saying out loud an observation. Her brain had grown and I had noticed. But my sister took this around with her for a long time saying that I had insulted her, saying that I was making fun of her. When actually, no, I meant what I had said. This is not the only time. She has another instance that is very similar to that, that she's still walking around with. And I'm like, honey, I didn't mean it any other way other than the actual words that came out of my mouth. I don't try to be derogatory. I don't try to hurt people. I am a highly empathic person. And when I hurt somebody, I feel it. And then I'm almost paralyzed. So I hurt equally almost to the same degree they do because I didn't intend to hurt. It's never my intention to hurt somebody's feelings. But I do struggle with people where I'm communicating and they will look at it at a lower level than what I am. And I had this happen very recently. I contacted Diane Powell, who's a researcher at Harvard, and she does psychic work. And I do some work with psychics. I work with psychics and my brain probably has these abilities, but I I'm mostly fascinated by how we see them as magic when in reality they're just higher sensing. So I'll give you an example. I have very high clear cognizance, which is a psychic ability, but it's not really a psychic ability. It's my ability to realize the connections between my emotions and my intellect. I realize my emotional feelings to intellectual knowledge. And it's very simple how I do it. I am able to use my intuition and actually drive my intuition to realization of full cognitive understanding. This is something that I can teach other people to do. Those who are psychic, they have this, that intuition feeling and they'll say it, but it's not to full. So a lot of times they'll come and work with me and they'll say, hey, how do I get it? And I'll tell them, this is how I do it. But literally what we're doing to achieve full potential, you want to marry your emotions and your intellect as one. It is trauma that drives your brain to be smarter. And then it seems to take it from your body. So your body becomes more sensitive and your brain becomes more able to process. Now, I don't recommend anybody running out and getting into trauma, but we're going to see this change in our population as the change comes because change induces trauma. Trauma for a lot of people is just simply change. And it can be positive and negative, but I think it's going to be more negative than positive. Trauma will be 
something that the entire civilization is going to undergo as we watch our civilization degrade, our economy degrade, and our ecology degrade. And those three things come together with the collapse of a society. I wrote them at Harvard and I said, hey, would you like to talk to me about the psychic stuff? I work in this space and I have a lot of insight into it. I'm not a really great sensor because the way I see it, you have to be on the same level as the person you're relating to or just a little bit above. And I'm just not there. I don't really know how average people's brains work until I've sat with them a little bit and then I can pattern them. But when I sit down with someone, the whole world is available to me for what their potential way of communicating is. And I really do have to map out how they were. And this goes back to that test question thing I said. I only need to study the questions. Because if I know the questions, I know how they're thinking. And then I can use their thinking style to answer the questions on the test without actually even knowing the content. And that's 2D world. That's the 2D world. This is the disability in our systems. It is set up to map the people who the teacher is like. It's set up to map the average or bright, not anyone else. So everybody else is at a disadvantage the people who are lower on the spectrum and higher on the spectrum are both on a disadvantage because their perspectives are not going to be the same as that teacher. Whoever that teacher is, is how that kid will be able to most mimic and think like and then do well in their class. If a child has neurodivergent teachers and they are neurodivergent, they tend to do well because they're thinking like them. And what is that driving that? Well, it's spatial giftedness again. Children with trauma, overwhelmingly, you'll find in the profoundly gifted group, children are born with some sort of trauma in their birth or while their mother is pregnant and or in their first year of life. And that does create this sensing, a higher sensing in the body because the body is trying to keep that child alive. And we have not exactly come out and said this, but if you talk to the people in the groups, they'll be like, yep, that's a normal thing. And this has been my experience. Not only did I have child, childhood trauma, I had infancy trauma. And spatial giftedness just means that you see more dimensions. You see more perspectives. You are capable of not only seeing your perspective, but you're capable of seeing other people's perspectives. And there are a lot of people who fall into the empathic area where this is a capability. You may be able to see this in science or math, or you may be able to see this in nature or animals, or you may be able to see this in music. It is different spots that you see this, but they tend to find that music, math, empathy, or music, math, emotions are the three profoundly gifted areas that you, these come up. And the, my family has savantism in all three of those areas. So savantism and profound gift go together. There's different versions of it. And there's three levels of savantism, but that ability to have more dimensional understanding in those areas is what drives our communication gap. And that gap is severe. I mean, we're talking about 160 plus IQ. And if 100 is the average person's IQ, or the global average IQ, then 100, you're 60 points away from them. If the breakdown is 20 to 30 points, according to 999 Science, which is the one percentile group that talks about having extreme intelligence, talking two different worlds. They're talking about a whole nother dimension. And this has been my experience. I literally speak in a way where people are like, I don't understand what you're saying. And I realize they're missing a third of the information. And as much as I feel frustrated when I'm learning something in school, in math or science or music, where it's not taking in my emotional state as part of the learning, where I'm not getting an understanding of how that actually applies in real life so that I can go and use it. How silly is it that we learn math without actually learning it applicable to the real world? I could build you a house the way I learned geometry, but in school, I couldn't apply it at all. It's random. It's crazy to me. And when I got into college, I was taking programming classes and I had to come up with theory and I had to come up with I had to come up with math and equations and and put those algorithms into the code I was making. I had to learn to do it then. I did not learn anything like that in school. It was not applicable at all. And I finally learned math in college because it had a full dimensions of the three dimensions of life. I need all three dimensions. The brain of the most intelligent needs to understand it applicable. It's our ability to apply it across other things. This is the creative genius. If you can see and know, then you can apply to other things. But if you don't have that third part or fourth part or fifth part, if you only have 2D, 
it's much harder to apply. So when I met my husband, I was amazed because he could do all of these engineering things and build pretty much anything. He knows electrical engineering. He knows computer engineering. He knows basically every kind of engineering science. But it turns out his father was a nuclear engineer and his father went through everything with him. And when my children were born, we got snap circuits and we got all these sort of building things because that's how they learned about coding. <laughs> We've already taught them how to code. They all know how to code because we started off with snap circuits and the zeros and ones. And then we built it up from there and we had ones that you could program and, and they had a great time with that and it was applicable. And so when they got to school, I didn't even have to teach them these things. They actually learned them as they were going. And that's why Montessori is so valuable to the children who are neurodivergent because it is teaching in that 3D way. The 2D way is a trap. The 2D way of teaching is a trap because it makes you, it proves that you're able to learn certain things or it proves that you're able to regurgitate thoughts, but it doesn't actually show that you're able to use them because you still need that third dimension. So then you go out into the world and then whatever your employer feels like giving you, that's what the third is rounded out as. But your employer is given a person who's not fully able to go get started. And that's kind of a, that's why it's hard for young people to get jobs first. When I went into public accounting, I was surprised that they hired me right out of college to start a division doing IT audit. But after a little bit, I realized, oh, they really don't want the smartest people doing this. Now, actually, for IT, they didn't have a clue. I mean, they didn't know there was a difference between software and hardware. And I didn't say anything in the interview because I needed a job. But I had to learn hardware really fast. I, I knew software. I did not know hardware. I knew systems, but I did not know hardware. So I had to learn hardware right away. I went into closets with blinking lights and was like, okay, I have no clue what these are. And I went and got certified in a million things so I could understand what those were. But I still found that the tests were not applying to real world experience. They were still 2D. So I could pass the test without really understanding what it was. And it was mind boggling to me that I could do this and I had to figure out after college that this was how you've passed, that it was really about the difference between me just regurgitating and thinking like that person. And that was how you connected. That's why average people connect over their average things. And everything in our world is set up to that average. So those of us who are different, those of us who are outliers, those of us who care about more depth because we need that 3D perspective, we're screwed. We're screwed in the real settings. We're screwed in work because we're told, oh, you're over communicating. And that's what happened to me with these Harvard people. I wrote them. I said, oh, I can explain this to you. I know how this works. I have multiple perspectives and mine include this one and above. And then they're like, okay, well, we'll test you. I'm going, well, I'm not going to test. Well, I don't test well, not in these things because I'm going to come in at my perspective, which is really high and yours is not going to be there. And I'm not exactly sure where yours are because I never really taken your test and I don't know you. This is not why I contacted you. I was contacting you to share what my perspective was. And they said, no, thanks. I couldn't pass the test. Well, fine, whatever. I mostly want the world to change and grow and be better. And if they want to believe that being a psychic is magic, and they're still looking for people to prove that, then so be it. It's the same thing with all of the testing for profoundly gifted people. We have issues with profoundly gifted people where their bodies are breaking down. And the science is like, that doesn't exist. Well, it does. I'm living it. There's other people I know that are living it. And you know where I found the answers? I found them in Robert Sapolsky's study of animals. Because animals, the brightest animals, die in captivity. They struggle in captivity. They will just stop eating. And that's sort of what happens to some of these kids who are brilliant or highly intelligent and sensitive. Animals know when they've lost their freedom. They know. And they know that they're trapped now. They're limited. They go insane in those cages pacing. And we are in one of those cages ourselves. We are limited. Robert Sapolsky, who is a professor at Stanford right now, but he used to be one at Harvard and, and all the other Ivy Leagues, he wrote Primate's Memoir, but he also wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And in that book, I found more gems on how the profoundly gifted move through the world than I've ever found in any gifted book. We are so sensitive. We have this ability to sense the environment we're in and build the patterns, we weave them together, we understand them, then we know what will come next. We can project what will go on. We're good with change because we already have that full dimensional understanding, but that makes us different communicators. So when I meet somebody who has autism, even if they're not in the gifted space, I still understand them. And this happened. This happened to me just when we moved into our new place. This young man showed up and he said, Hi, welcome to the neighborhood. I'd like to give you this table. 
<laughs> we were like, thank you. We have a million tables though. So no, thank you. And he's like, oh, okay. Then he came back later with a handful of change and he gave me the change and he said, hi, welcome to the neighborhood again. I wanted to give you this. Please accept it. It will break my heart if you don't. And I, <laughs> I accepted it because it was so cute. And this man is a young man. He's in the twenties. Maybe he's thirties. He lives with his mother. He has autism and he is the purest human being I've met so far outside of my own daughter and myself. <laughs> but we have that sweet sensing way. I mean, I guarantee you his mother said, please take this. It will break my heart if you don't. And so he repeated it. And I watched my own children grow up like that, where they mimicked me. And I watch it with my niece, my sister's daughter. She is such a younger version of her mother. She speaks just like her, even though her mother is very articulate, uses very large vocabulary. That's how my niece is running around at five and three and, and four. It's hilarious and the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. These children walk through the world as little professors because they're speaking like what they've heard. They are not children who go up through the the education system and learn that they learn from the environment they're in. And that is a massive difference in learning style it is a massive difference in communication style and is a massive difference in living. We are not broken. We are exceptional. And as things degrade in our society, you will be thankful for your higher sensing. You'll be thankful for your 3D abilities, your 4D, 5D, et cetera, abilities, because you will never need to worry about trusting your own judgment the vast majority of the population will. They will be very fearful. And we can see that right now where we have this major division between the Republicans and Democrats. I don't care about either party. They are obvious to me that they are just playing sides. And the Democrats, I don't believe, will ever have the same fever or blind following that the Republicans will because the Democrats tend to have more educated people and more educated people tend to be a little bit more spatial. I do not believe that we will see radicalism to the same level. They're both conservative parties. If you go to Europe, they'll tell you both of them are conservative. One's ultra conservative and one's conservative. We do not have any liberal party in our country. We don't even have a moderate party in our country. We have two conservative parties. And I can see that. I could totally see that. I don't know why everyone else cannot. I don't know why everyone else cannot see a million zillion things. I don't know why Harvard would think that psychic abilities are magic. They're not magic. They're higher sensing. Animals have this. Cats and dogs and birds, they all know before earthquake hits that it's coming. You see them running around, racing around. You see birds take flight. You see them quiet down and take flight. You see dogs start barking and then get quiet. Animals can sense these things. And we are humans and we are animals as well. I don't think the whole entire group needs to be able to sense it just a few do. And if those few say, oh my gosh, something's coming, they all get quiet. And then they say fly. And then they take flight. Because those animals are communicating with each other. And we have been separated from that. And we need to go back to that. We need to go back to that because our governments have used us. They put us into this machine, which is the society. And the society has produced and produced, produced. But now it's not producing for the vast majority. And while it marginalized the most spatially gifted, because it needed to separate the philosopher types, the humanities types from the math and science types, because that's the way they could control the math and science types. They, they identified them. And I've talked about this before. I've talked about how in the testing, my math savant is the one that tested 99th percentile in English, whereas my other two kids who would be more English savants have never scored that high because they were testing not for them. They were testing 2D for my math savant. Now, I'm not saying that she doesn't have that capability, but she is not programmed for that as her main gift. And her siblings are programmed for it. And they've been shut out. I've been shut out. So the savants of humanities, the people who are gifted in that space, the psychics, that's what we are. We're just all really good at understanding people patterns. The rest of you are good at understanding nature and math and numbers patterns. So it's not like math isn't natural. It's very natural. And that makes sense to me. It's watching my daughter learn it to a graduate school level when I taught her nothing. She has not really been introduced to it, but she did play a lot of spatial games. She did a lot of time in nature. We did a lot of things that would have taught her those theories because she would have seen them just by being. We learn so much we cannot be cultured. We learn so much we cannot be made into the repetitive droids of the population. And so we must be marginalized. And so we are. There's so many studies out there showing how autism and, and profound intelligence are connected. And yet when I say I have autism, people are like, oh, do you need help? No, thank you. I am so tired of being treated as if there's something wrong with me, even though I 
have never, ever really needed anyone. I wasn't given a good education and it didn't matter. I wasn't given a good parenting and it didn't matter. I wasn't given a lot of resources and it didn't matter. And yet, I'm the one who's considered less than. Ironic, isn't it? But as things change, I mean, we know that they're now caring about the neurodivergence. And when every civilization falls, they start caring about the creatives because they need the creatives. Change requires creative people. Change is what creative people can foresee and adjust and address. The rest of the population, though, they're 2D, and they are only good at getting information in and regurgitating it. Now, of course, this is a spectrum. There are people who are extremely good at it, and there are people who are extremely bad at it. I am capable of doing the system work, but I want to die in it. It's not enough for me. It's not engaging. And I sit in those meetings and I'm talked down to because I see things that other people can't. When we talk about strategic or planning, I disagree with everything they're saying. I'm like, that will not work. And they'll be like, well, why won't it work? And I'll tell them, I'll list them. I'm like, well, if you know so much, you tell us what you would do. So I tell them and they all stare at me like I have a third eye or I have something growing out of my face that's not supposed to be there because they can't even understand what I'm saying. They cannot see how I got from where they were to where I am because they lack that third dimension, that extra perspectives. We have so many gifts that we have been denied, but they're still there. They're still cultivated by our society. We just have to change our mindset to change the way we see them. Truth is you have so many gifts. You are so talented. You have a way of moving through the world that everybody is going to be seeking very shortly. And yes, they're going to deny you this as much as they can to maintain control. But you only need to know the truth yourself. And by doing that, you will be able to gain control. You are incredibly powerful. You have incredible knowledge. And while many of it may manifest right now as emotions, there is a way to cultivate that so that you can manifest your emotions into intellect. I had to learn to do this as a little girl because my emotions were so high. I was drowning in them. But my brain, which in most children's brains are connected in emotions and intellect, I had to, I was forced to maintain it. I wasn't allowed to because the system was so strong. And it is ironic. It's almost as if the system creates the genius by stressing these children way beyond what they should. They should not be in constant like middle high stress. Stress is something that you fear, like when the tiger's going to get you and then you go home and you're safe and you shake. This is Peter Levine's book where he said, you know, the animals were almost killed. They're caught. They went back to their herd and they shook. And I shake. I shake when I have a trauma. I shake when I get around people who are not good for me. I shake when I get to a safe place. But you know what that is? That's my overexcitability. My overexcitability is coming up and processing all those inputs like don't go out with that guy again. Don't go near this person person or place again. That was scary. You just almost died in that car accident. Don't do that again. That is what trauma is. Trauma is an actual natural part, but we don't allow people the third dimension to heal. And so they're trapped in their trauma. When I go into the workforce, I am very aware of the oppression there. I am too aware. Every autistic person is, every ADHD person is, even if they're not able to word it, all those emotions are screaming, this is oppression. This isn't good for us. This is bad. This is too much stress every day in, day out. Let's find a better deal. You're too smart for this. You're being underutilized. You're bored and you're losing your mind because the stress, the stress over figuring out where they're at because they're never going to figure out where you're at. They think that that's your job. We're all trained to take the most brilliant people and oppress them. Every single one of us. I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. When I was going through the school system, if somebody was smart in an area I wasn't, or they had interest in an area I wasn't, I was like, oh, that's weird. Even though I'm just like that in different areas. The other thing that I want to talk about with this communication thing is your special interest and your super focus you tend to settle in things that are pertinent to your life. You're interested in things that are around you. You're interested in things that will make your life better, that will make your life enhanced. We are not random in the things we like. There are things that are around us. There's things that we're introduced to in the world and we want to figure out. So of course you're going to talk about it. Other people are amazing gifts of knowledge, fountains of information that we should be sharing and growing together. You should be able to go to every person in your town and get information on. And it shouldn't be weird because that would be a natural state. Everyone has something to offer. But the oppression of our system, the oppression of intelligence is that you aren't allowed to talk that you can only do the pleasantries. And by not by having everybody not connect enough, 
We give power away. We give power upward. We let the people at the top. So what are we governed by? We're governed by a bunch of man babies, a bunch of people who are tyrannical idiots who feel they deserve things and they haven't earned them. There's no reason for it. They're not the smartest. They're not the most generous. They're not the giving. They're not anything that should justify the way that they've gotten to the space that they have. Other than we just all have been programmed to believe that they should. That's ridiculous. And with what is coming, if we don't take our power, if we don't try to recognize how much skill we have and we, we, we form a collective and we, we band together and we really re, we take back our abilities to cultivate each other, we will be more oppressed than ever. I was watching this movie about automatons of 200 years ago. And this was in a time in Europe when they had extreme gaps of wealth they had extreme poverty and the huge divide of resources. The wealthy were obsessed with replacing people with robots. They're not robots, but these automatons. Just like now, where AI is going to replace all the humans and the employees, they were going to do this with that. It's ridiculous. They're not going to do that. There was still this obsession with it, and they basically enslaved all the watchmakers and all the artisans and made them build these robotic kind of moved on watchmaking time movements. It was a fascinating video and I'm going to post it in the notes below because I think you should watch it. It really is where we're going. It's it's exact same time today, but we're going into this. People do not understand the process that we're going, the automata, what it's called, the designed, the extraordinary robots of 200 years ago. We're back there again where they think they're going to replace us with robots and they're all giddy. But what they don't realize is that they ruin the most brilliant. And we've already lost that. We've already lost the most brilliant. I think of GE as the best example. Another book I recommend is The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. This is a book by Thomas Philippone, economist, who really does lay it out beautifully. One of the things he talks about in his book was how GE back in the 70s really was amazing. I mean, if you think about it, we went to the moon in the 70s. And if you think about the technology we used to go to the moon in the 70s, it was fairly rudimentary. And yet we made it up there. And since that time, we have not really gone to many other places. We've made rovers and such that have gone to NASA for NASA have gone to Mars, we've sent them out satellites, but we haven't sent people anywhere else. We have really just sort of capitalized on the information that we learned in the 70s, and rolled it out to the phones and the telecommunications networks we have. And we've not done nearly as many leaps and bounds as we had back in the 50s or 70s. 50s and 70s was when the neurodivergence, gifted neurodivergence, were in the workforce, when we were actually had 40-hour work weeks, when people were not being worn out and prevented from knowing their children because they were working so much. It was a time where there was reasonable wages, there was people lived well, they could afford other people to help them cover areas they couldn't. And the neurodivergence really had a great run there. They really contributed to society and it was it was really fair and equal. And then it started turning. And by the time I got out there, it was 2000. And in the 2000s, I totally could not find that fairness. When I was in high school in the 90s, when I was in college, I was able to make a living working in my jobs and going to school. And I took out loans and it wasn't horrible, but it is ridiculous now. It is ridiculous. They've made it so hard for anyone who doesn't come from upper middle class or middle class with with fair amount of resources behind them to be successful. And my parents who came from success didn't go to college. They went both went to college and dropped out because they just couldn't do it because they their neurodivergence was so great and they just didn't learn anything. Both of them were kind of not academic. They're not self-learners. They don't really understand how the world works. They're just very frustrated by everything and they are, they're artists. So they just sort of want to create, but they're not good at learning on their own. I don't know how the heck I got, came out of them. But I do know that my stepfather, who was also a musical savant, he wasn't quite as high in his neurodivergence as my father. He introduced me to many intellectual things. He introduced me to John Cage's album where they just, <laughs> they just had silence for four minutes and 33 seconds. He introduced me to music that pretty much sounded like somebody was playing on garbage cans with maybe some glasses in nearby. And 
I never understood it. I I was confused as heck. Like, okay, we're listening to this. We went to see Bobby McFerrin when I was a little kid. We did lots of interesting things because he was an intellectual musician, whereas my mother is more folky. I thank him for just being the, another variation of that one that was more of a thinking version that he really did love what he did because up until that point, I hadn't seen that. I'd seen people miserable in their lives. And that's what I thought my life would be. Now, I'm not very close with my stepfather, but just the fact that he moved through the world as he was, as a highly neurodivergent human being who just kind of accepted the fact that he was that way and didn't really fight it, it gave me one example that that could be possible. I did not get that from anyone else that I was related to. It was enough to know that if one person who moves through the world just in their own odd way can do that and and find peace and contentment, then I could do it too. It was allowable. We are not taught that. We are not taught that in the systems. We're taught everything against that. And so we really do need each other to teach ourselves and to teach each other, to teach our children that this is perfectly acceptable and that this is the way you find success. It is us. It is us who are wired for it. If you look at the communication out there, everything on neurodivergence, everything on genius, everything on profound giftedness, none of it is actually how it really is. When I read it, I'm very frustrated. It's almost like reading the Bible and knowing that the person who's writing it definitely wasn't the same level of intellect as the prophet they're talking about. It's that in every historical book, all of those things are are about somebody who is profoundly gifted, somebody who's who's an exceptional human being who had incredible intelligence and sensing ability. And none of it is actually from their perspective. It is all from the average person's perspective looking at them. So it's all from the outside. But from the inside, it's nothing like they say. It's not. It's exactly how you are. It's exactly how I am. I am compelled to do this. I'm compelled to sit here every week and figure this stuff out so I can put it down for you. So I can put it down for me. So I can put it down for my children. It's very important that I figure this out, that I go through this and undo the lies that I was told because I don't want the psychological oppression on others. I don't want anyone to have to go to it. I especially don't want people who are like me going through the system taking a choice that ends their life when they could just have been told what I'm telling you right now. I needed this so badly when I was younger and they didn't have it. And now the information's coming out because they're caring enough because they need the neurodivergence enough. They need our multiple perspectives. They need our ability to create change by having creative ability. They need us now. So they're starting to release this information and study us like we are important. But we were not important. I had to go and study animals to figure out what was natural for me because I knew that I had higher sensing and that the only place I saw that was in the in the animal world. Everyone I know who is a gifted neurodivergent has the ability to move through the world understanding with greater dimension everything. It is the emotions that deliver that information. It is your emotions that make you multiple perspectives. This is why they're wrong about the psychic part, because it's not psychic. That is a term that I don't think really does it justice. It's intelligence. Whether or not you're feeling it or you're actually realizing it is just a minor tweaking. Somebody asked me once, how do I know what is my intuition versus what is my body or what is my mind? And I said, well... When I had my babies, my intuition was screaming at me, go get the baby, go get the baby. Every time I dropped my brand new child off at daycare, it's like, go get that baby. Every cell in my body was screaming, go get that baby. That is intuition. It's like when you have this urgency to go do something, but it's not a sensing thing. It's just something that you know you have to do. When I had my sensing comes up, it's, it's saying, you know, it's the ruminating, it's the putting the pictures together, that's the connecting of it. But my sensing is me just having a lot of emotions. But the go get the baby was an action. It was an, a direction from my body. My intellect, I have this rational thinking. My brain is saying something very logical, something I was learned through books or reading about other people or in school. And I had a client and she said, I don't know who to follow. I don't know who to follow. My body is saying, you know, go be free, get away from everything, go to the mountains, like get away from everyone. And then my brain is saying, you know, when you're 90, is this going to have worked? Will this really be a long-term plan? Is this right? And I said, well, you don't do either. You take the middle because what you're doing is you have two messages coming at you. You have to make them come together as one. 
And that's where the truth is. Your intuition is that middle part, isn't it? And she goes, oh my gosh, yes. And that's just it. Our communication is never going to be the same as others because we have it from two different sources and we're hitting the middle. They're just repeating what they taught. We have three. We take in what's out there. We take in what our patterns are from the sensing of our prior. And then we have our intellectual side, which says, you know, don't forget these other things. And then we create that multidimensional model and we know how to move through the world. We create our own paths. And do I know what the entire future looks like? No, but I know pieces. I know parts of the picture. And every time I put down a new stone in my path of going towards what, what is our future, I see more. It gets me a little closer to seeing the big full picture. We have the ability to survive, to thrive in what is coming. Everybody is completely unprepared, but you have the natural ability and you will, if you go into who you are, if you go into your sensing, if you go into understanding and trusting yourself and knowing that the way you communicate is normal for you and that all those times that you have been misunderstood and you have to put it into a story to explain it to other people. And if you haven't created the story yet, you're like, oh my gosh, I just can't say anything, even though I know this is wrong. That is normal. When you read books about Confucius and you read books about Native Americans and you read books about these wise elders who knew and spoke in this cryptic way. That's what they're saying. They're saying, I have to communicate this in some way that you'll understand, but I see it so many times bigger. And that's how it is for all the historical texts on genius and intelligence and, and all of those people. It's wrong. It's from another person's outside perspective who doesn't have that brain. Your brain is amazing. It's perfect. Your communication style is what you need it to be. The only thing you need to do is go into it. And then the rest of the pieces will come together and you'll be able to explain it. But I knew long before everyone else did what was wrong. And then I had to go seeking the pieces. So I had the vocabulary to tell them because I wasn't born with the vocabulary. The world has created vocabulary. And then they parse it out. Now, though, information is more available than ever. Keep talking about how we have so much information that they're using it against us. It's weaponized. But you, you have the gift. You have that spatial giftedness that you can take back that weapon and turn it into your own, or you can turn it into an act of peace. And I've chosen to turn it into an act of peace by educating those like me so that they are not broken, so that we maintain the most beautiful, intelligent, wonderful, creative people, and we give them a chance to have a full life. This is all I'm going to talk about today. I hope this was valuable to you. Please let me know if it is or isn't. I want to give you something that is valuable. I'm, I thank you for listening, and I hope you'll listen to me again. Take care. The views, information, and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent Gifted NT Incorporated, Lillian Skinner, or the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. This podcast, Lillian Skinner, and Gifted NT Incorporated are not responsible and do not verify the accuracy of the information contained in this podcast series. The primary purpose of this podcast is to inform and educate. The Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast is only available for private, non-commercial use. Any other use of the information contained within this podcast must be done with express written approval and knowledge of Lillian Skinner. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute any part of this podcast. The developer assumes no liability for this podcast or its use on any other podcast or other media.